Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first audiovisual podcast of the Mad Women podcast. I am your host, Sunita Deshpande, and I want to thank you so much, all the women joining us tonight. We are part of the Sideshow, and we're so excited to be here with you because we're talking today about how to get to the role of a creative director or above in the game of advertising. And if you are a woman out there watching right now, you might be wondering the same for yourself. How do I do it? How do I climb the corporate ladder? How do I make it? Um, today, I have some incredible women to talk to. I am so excited, but first a quick little bit about me. I started off in the advertising game as a young buck. I was right out of Miami ad school as a copywriter, and I worked for many years at Berlin Cameron, and then I freelanced myself um, at various agencies as a copywriter. And I noticed um, that there weren't very many people that looked like me. <laughs> and they also noticed there weren't very many women who were creative directors or above. And I always wondered why that was, because I was surrounded by so many brilliant creative minds, strategists, but never creative directors, um, especially women of color or people of color. Um, and I also noticed that in castings, because I am also an actor myself, that there weren't very many people of color in commercials being selected. And that was also very strange to me. So because I have a background in improv and acting, I took some more acting classes in improv and I wanted to be that person in the room who, well, you have to be the like change you wish to see in the world, hopefully. Um, so I started auditioning some more and I booked some commercials that I've been very proud to do. Um, I got to do improv with Tina Fey in an American Express commercial. I've been in various Kohl's commercials. And most recently I was incredibly lucky to book eight episodes as a guest star on the TV show Daredevil, which is a Marvel TV show. Um, all while being a copywriter and a creative director. And that was my way of kind of always staying in the ad game because I have always been in love with ideas. And and that being said, today I have three incredible ladies who have joined me from Shiat Day LA and also Strawberry Frog. So I would very much like you to, I guess, emoji clap for Danielle Veith, Liz Carthright, and uh, Kirsten Rutherford. I want to make sure I got all those names right. Thank you, ladies, so much for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you for you're the ones we're looking up to, and you're the ones that we're going to be asking lots of questions to. So let me get us started right now. Um, give us a first a uh, couple lines each of why you love the ad game, how you got started, and what keeps you motivated. I'll let you each take it one at a time, and a little bit about you know you to, for us to get to know you. I'll pick on each person. Danielle, please first. Yeah, I'll start. Um, so how I really got into advertising was I wanted a career where I could get paid well to write. And, you know, even going into undergrad, I didn't really know what that looked like. I was like, oh, maybe I'll major in English. And, and luckily my school had a really strong advertising department and that, mm -hmm. that became my major. And when I kind of discovered it, I just fell in love with it. Um, and then I went to work actually at Shiat LA. It was my first job. and. And, but I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know the difference between creative department, other departments. And I talked to all the creatives there. I didn't have like a book yet. And mm -hmm. they I would sneak up to the creative floor. I was afraid I was going to get fired if people knew I wanted to be a writer. I knew nothing really, except that I wanted to do advertising. And they were like, you have to go to one of these ad schools. Mm -hmm. So I did. Um, and then, you know, the rest is history. And I know so many people have changed careers a lot in their lives. And, and I just haven't. It's just been my thing. Like, from early on, I feel lucky that I discovered it early and stayed on that path. Um, what I love about it is, I mean, I love getting paid to come up with ideas. I think that's a privilege and it's really fun, but I also love the challenge of creativity and commerce and really marrying those two. Yeah. And are we solving a business problem? Are we doing it with the best creative execution? And I think what keeps me motivated is the chase for always the next best idea. Um, it's just like elusive and kind of endless. There's always more. And, and then also now working with younger people and talking with them about ideas and helping them along. And, mm -hmm. and this is women, like we, at least when I started, weren't really mentored. You kind of yeah. had to on your own. And I do have male colleagues who were taken under their wings by absolute. Yeah. Uh, had legends in the business take them under their wing and so that's yeah. just that's just a little different so I love um being able to to help out that way too 
That's, yeah, that's so interesting. I, sometimes I've described it as like, you know, back in the day, like the knights would take that new page under their wing and help them kind of become a better swordsman and become better with whatever else that had to go with being a knight. Um, but it was just very rare. My joke was always like the queen was just like, who's prettier than me? All right, kill her. Um, so that was, <laughs> that was always my like joke, but also like a dark joke. Um, but yeah, that's something that I've really thought about too. It's just having someone who's a mentor there for you, no matter what, to help you out um, and call you on your bullshit and also just help you push ahead um, and not like the little, little uh, losses get you down. Kirsten, how about yourself? I, uh, I'm one of these precocious, precocious brats that wanted to be in advertising from the age of seven. I know that seems really weird, but my father <laughs> was advertising and my earliest memories of getting to spend quality time with my dad was when he would take me into Leo Burnett's in New Zealand on the weekend and it would be the only time I was ever allowed to drink fizzy drink because they had Sprite as a client. Ah. So for some reason I got brainwashed into wanting to do advertising for <laughs> Uh, thinking that it would provide me some sweetness. And to be honest, it went from being sugary sweetness to allowing me to find my purpose. And my purpose is to make the world a better place through kindness and creativity. And I'm so grateful that when we have creative skills, we are able to put them out into the world and have a little bit of a ripple, even in the smallest of ways. Yeah. But again, Danielle, I hear you, what a privilege it is to be able to do that. Um, so that's what keeps me going. That's my motivation. That's why I love it. Um, when I was younger, the motivation was also to do the best work of my life. And now it's to help others do the best work of their lives. It's so evident in your work too. You know, I was just talking about this with another relative the other day, because in my culture, um, going into being a doctor or science, which is incredible, um, is pr kind of seen as the only, um, like it's almost like academic intelligence is so valued, but there is just something about empathy that is, I am, I feel needs to be brought more to the world, whether it is as a writer or as an actor or both. Um, it's and ultimately at the end of the day, from what I've noticed from the best ads in the whole world, it's, it's emotion that grabs that person, stops them in their tracks, cuts through the clutter and just grabs them and makes them change their ways or think about something differently. And so it's very interesting to see it in, in your work and what you talk about because empathy is, it's key. Thank you so much. Um, all right, Liz. Um, I got into advertising because my older brother was a copywriter and oh. Um, I, I knew I always wanted to be creative in my career, but I didn't know advertising and creative, being a creative in advertising existed as a job path um, until my brother became a copywriter. And I um, went to the Creative Circus in Atlanta. Um, and uh, for the first time, I felt like my mind was being used the way it was designed to be used, uh, using creativity to solve problems. And it just, it felt like, whole side of my brain was just getting lit up for the first time um and it still feels that way and it feels so good to exercise my brain in a way that i think it was created to be used um one of the things i love about this job is that i get paid to daydream <laughs> so much of my work you're going to just see little sparks of daydreams that i had and somehow they've I convince clients to pay for them. Um, and, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you know, they, they also hopefully sol solve communication problems too. And I, I really do enjoy looking at a brief and looking at it like a puzzle and how can I solve it? Um, what keeps me motivated is I'm, I don't know this is a good thing, but I'm competitive with myself. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't like feeling like I'm, I've, I'm done. Um, so I, I'm always looking to see how I can continue to push myself. And another big motivator is just people who believe in me. I'm lucky enough to work with people like Kirsten and our uh, CCO, Hanato, who really do a good job of making me feel empowered. Yeah, and that is, a, that is such an important part of it all about, like we we're going back to like the nights. It's somebody who did really take you under their wing and to push you forward and to be like, is that really the best you can do? Um, yep. We all, I feel like there, it's like, Depends on the generation you're from, but we all need the Mr. Miyagi's and the Pai Mays in our life. Um, as women would be great too. Um, so I'm gonna just get on to more questions. And if you're watching right now and you have any questions, please feel free to push them forward. I will have them answered for you. 
What would you say is currently, and I'll let you all pitch in whenever you want to, is your biggest victory? And what would you say is your biggest failures that you've learned for from? I'll go. Um, I think I'll go, I'll start with the failure. Get that out of the way. I um, There was a project I was working on. Um, I was one of the lead creatives on it, but I wasn't the CD and um, we were going down a path that I felt like the idea was getting lost mm -hmm. and I voiced it, but maybe not as loud as I should have. And I kind of went along and I trusted that the people above me knew what they were doing um, or had had a, had a compass of where the idea should go. And as the project progressed, that voice inside of me stayed very loud, but it just kept moving. And then sure enough, the project was uh, a mess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I remember uh, getting into the edit room with my creative director and I was like, I honestly don't know what, what we're going to be editing together. And he, he was like, isn't that exciting? I was like, no, this is not exciting. <laughs> was this uh, a script for a TV yeah, commercial? It, okay. It was a big film. Um, had us going all around the world. And it just basically turned into a mood film because mm. the idea had been sucked out of it and mm -hmm. uh, we we try to scramble something together in the edit but it just fell flat so what i learned from that is don't ignore your instincts as a creative yeah. and speak loudly even if it causes friction mm -hmm. um, just find ways to do it that minimize the friction <laughs> um, and then i'm I, I would say one of my greatest achievements is uh I'm really proud of the a film I made called Like a Mother. Um, it started off as a as an idea long before um, Serena became a mother or uh, I became a mother of just wanting to celebrate women mothers who are also elite athletes because I think that gets minimized a lot in conversation. You don't really look at mothers as being powerful forces, and then stars aligned and uh, because I had been really proactive about pushing this idea when Serena um, had her her first child um, and was going to Wimbledon, I was able to kind of push the idea through him. So that was just a big lesson of being your own advocate and mm -hmm. invite yourself to a brief, even if that brief doesn't exist yet. <laughs> Yeah, that's what's so funny sometimes too is with the whole feeling of uh, if you build it, they will come or it will come to fruition. Weirdly enough with the sideshow, Josh and I were just chatting on the phone one day and we were, this was in July and we were just like, what are you doing? Well, what are you doing? And we were just talking about, you know, being creatives in the advertising industry and you're already sensitive enough as a creative about everything, which is what makes you a great creative. But like you said, it's also commerce meeting art. And um, he was just like, you know, I just really want to create something big. And he just riffed off this idea about like, you know, everybody's being told to do side projects now and be interesting to have a showcase about it. And I was like, wow, you know, on an emotional level, that's actually very brilliant. I said, because so many people are so bummed out right now. And so many people are depressed or they're at home every day in pajamas. Um, and it's feel they might feel very unproductive. Um, and so that's why this has, whole thing has happened too. And we really had no idea the amount of talents, the uh, levels of people that we would attract um, to the sideshow. And it's been a really great um, lesson in the sense of if you build it, they will come, it will happen. It's just, you kind of have to, like you said, trust that gut instinct and just go forward. Um, what was it like to work with Serena? I didn't actually get to meet Serena, oh. unfortunately, but I did speak with her mother and that was, you know, she gave birth to Serena. So that was pretty amazing. Um, and she was lovely to work with. She has a really amazing voice. Like we were all worried because she wasn't a, a trained actress, would she be mm -hmm. able to cover the, the script with power and Miss Orsine has a very powerful voice. So if you ever need a powerful woman VO, <laughs> That's so good to know. You never know with the athletes if they're going to be a good actor or not. It's always a, yeah, it's always a toss up. I can um, actually answer that question though, because I have worked with Serena. 
so uh, we did a, a spot with her called uh, Sisters in Sweat, and it was celebrating uh, young women and encouraging them to keep playing sports. And this was when Serena had just had her baby. Uh, so it was the first time we got to see Serena. We were meant to be shooting her and her, her little one, but her little one was six weeks old and actually ended up having a cold that day, so couldn't be on set. Um, but she is, Serena is an absolutely incredible woman. Liz, I completely second you on that powerful voice. We had five minutes at the end of our, our shoot with her and she had this incredible script to deliver. You would read her a line, she would say it back to you, absolutely spot on. And that gravitas and that voice is just, she's as powerful as you think she's going to be in person. Oh, why don't we, uh, while we have you, why don't we, uh, your greatest accomplishments um, and the greatest failure? Well, you know, when we think about failures, I'd like to think of them as learning curves. And there's been many, many, many learning curves in my life. Um, one of my favorite learning curves was uh, as, a, as a young creative, maybe a year or so in the industry, um, I had entered a creative competition for, back in the day, postcards were a really big thing as a media buy. You would have go into cafes and you'd have a rack of postcards. So it was a competition to draw attention to STD testing. And I created a postcard that had very good looking people on the front. And when you picked it up, it would say on the back, you've just picked up chlamydia, you've just picked up syphilis. Uh, won the competition and it was never meant to go public. They called me up and said, gosh, could we make them go public? In my enthusiasm, I said yes, without recognizing that I'd just taken stock imagery from somewhere and had oh. the right to these models. Cue my boss, my chief creative officer, getting an irate phone call from the model's agent, uh, recognizing that I'd implied they had an STD without their permission. Uh, my boss talked them down from the ledge, turned to me, I thought I was going to be fired, and he just laughed. So wow. he said, whatever you do, don't do it again. So a, <laughs> a wonderful lesson is enthusiasm is amazing, but know when to temper it. And secondly, know that we're all going to make mistakes. And if you're a boss, just have a little bit of heart and maybe see the funny side when people do make mistakes, if you can. I think a I think a really good boss kind of will. I, that that was like a Friends episode, I think, with Joey <laughs> Triviani, like everyone on the subway thinking. And what about what you say was your greatest victory? I mean, it's always been the side projects that have really, really brought a lot of heart to me, and and, and what I'm most proud of. Um, I had an incredible client called Janelle Hollis, who I worked with on a detergent brand back in the day at Chiat. And when she left that detergent brand, she ended up at the Make-A-Wish Foundation. Mm. So I contacted her on LinkedIn and said, hey, would you ever like any help? She said, I'd love some help. And do you think Chiat would want to help too? And Chiat, lovely, lovely team there said, yes, we're more than willing to help you create work for Make-A-Wish. Uh, so I've had the privilege over the last sort of three years of leading the charge for work for the Make-A-Wish Foundation. And that just has meant so much to me to be able to incorporate Wish Kids and their families and, and make a bit of a difference there. So I'm, I'm, I'm most proud of that. It's wonderful. And Danielle? Um, I, you know, it's so funny, my biggest failure, I'm like, there's just too many. It's like the greatest hits list. But I think, and I, and I do think so many when I was first starting out, because you just make mistakes because you just don't yeah. know what you know. But I do remember my first job and I was, I was working in San Francisco and then we back then we'd fly to L LA to make a radio spot. And anyway, things are different now. Now we're like yeah. doing radio. money. Yeah. I remember, and it was my first one. And my boss said to me, he said, don't fuck it up and don't embarrass the agency. And I was like, okay, no pressure. And we'd hired this, um, had this character actor and I'm sorry to him. I don't remember his name, but had been on a lot of Seinfeld episodes and so I thought, cool, we have our script, but he'll be able to like improv some stuff too, yeah. and we'll get him to riff some stuff. And, you know, I'm there with the sound engineer. I must have had an account person with me. I don't even remember. And the script was just running short. It just wasn't long enough. And so I remember having to call my boss and being like, I don't know what to do. Like, this was the script that was approved. I'm trying to get the actor to like, give me something extra. And he just is, was very much like the stick to the script kind yeah. of fine. And so I called my boss and he's like, he'll, we'll just write, you'll just write your way out of it. Just, you know, whatever. And he was very nice. And then I got back to the office and a friend of mine said that he was sitting in his, uh, office with him while the boss was talking to me and he was shaking his head and he was like oh my god we're screwed 
<laughs> and I thought, oh, it was all okay. And like, it, it did come out okay. But um, I think because I was so like warned not to screw it up and yeah. you know, I'd never done any kind of production. Um, so, you know, you learn as you go, but I feel like there's a million stories like that, different, different little things. I think another, yeah. another one is just um, taking things personally a lot because mm -hmm. so connected to our creative work and it's like an extension of you, but it's not necessarily personal when something mm -hmm. goes in or doesn't go forward. Um, and then really my biggest accomplishment was I just had this idea, like when I got out of school, I'm like, I really want to live and work overseas. Mm. And then I really want to do it before I'm 30. And mm. I, I was, I think 29 and I just, I went over to London and Amsterdam and I just met with anyone that I could. Mm -hmm. I remember I got back to the States and I thought it was not going to happen. And then I ended up getting a call from mother in London and they brought me over and I, I ended up working there. And I kind of was like, once I remember turning 30 in London, I think I moved there two months before my birthday. And I'm not usually that specific with a goal as far as like an age goal or whatever. And I just remember that moment and like the place I was on my birthday, I'm like, oh my gosh, I just pulled that off. That was cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so I think too, like following little pieces of your intuition like that, that you just have a desire to go somewhere and do something and you're not quite sure why. I mean, I knew I loved that agency, but, and I knew I just wanted to, different experience of, you know, a different culture. Um, and I made a lot of mistakes there because I naively too thought like, oh, it's such a similar culture to America. We speak the same language. No, we don't. And as a writer too, I really got a lot of nuances and of course humor is different. Um, but funny story about that. Once I came back to the US, I later had a friend from there bring me into freelance, something that they hadn't been able to crack in the agency. Mm -hmm. I said, finally, someone gets British humor. And I'm like, okay, I guess I learned a few things. Well, <laughs> then there you go. Yeah. yeah. I'm a big fan of bit, anything British comedies. Like I'm, I'm so in love with, I love Toast of London. I love the IT crowd. Like British comedy is just for me and British actors are where it's at. Cause they're just like, there's a reason they're coming to the U S and taking all the U S parts. Like they're phenomenal. Yeah. Um, and it's really funny when you talk about the, um, we're talking about sports acting but also just actors, actor, actors, a lot of times we might assume that they're one personality and then you get to set with them or you get to a record with them and you think they're going to be one way because they've been this way the whole time you've seen them on TV and then they either freeze up or they can't perform the part or, or I worked with somebody who is very, very, very famous actor's son and just the work that his son could do versus the actor father, it didn't, the fruit fell far from the tree. Right. Say. Um, so when you're like kind of line reading with them, trying to feed them lines and you're like, your dad is so famous though. It's really important lesson to me was for the future to always have those one liners um, in the back pocket, literally in your back pocket, if they are not working for a commercial shoot or something, because some people just can't have that ability to improvise on set. Not everyone can teach comedic timing, you know, it's just right. something that's often inherent. Yeah. Um, so I'm gonna keep saying it. If you guys have any questions, ladies watching, if you have any questions about moving up the corporate ladder, what it was like for, for them, what like lessons they can teach you, please ask. And I'm gonna keep on going. Um, okay, so this is pretty much it. What is the best way for a young female creative to stand out when they feel that they might not be getting heard um, at their current ad agency due to it being a boys club or they might feel that they're for other reasons, uh, microaggressions, which also exist for so many different prejudices out there. What would you say, um, what, for, for example, uh, when people come to me and they have asked me like, oh, you know, my partner gets to work late. My partner doesn't deliver. I'm a copywriter. I'm there on time. And my partner is, you know, whatever stoned or they're showing up without, with half baked ideas. Sorry. I had to say that, but what, what would you do? And I often tell them just make sure you keep getting to work on time and then try to be as proactive as possible. Try to pick up any other briefs that might be going up the agency, um, express interest to your CCO or CD about other things that you could work on, work with other partners, um, for other opportunities. Those, those are the kind of, um, answers I tend to give to them. Them, um, because eventually you will be seen as that harder worker who's putting in more time. Um, but for you specifically, what is the best way for a young female creative to stand out when they feel that they might need, not be getting heard? And whoever wants to answer can go ahead. 
I would, I mean, I'll, I'll go ahead. I would say, um, you know, think about why, and is it, are you, are you speaking up as much as the men? Like just their studies, like men tend to speak up in groups more than women. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also, it's so funny. I used to work with this guy that I'm like, this dude loves his ideas more than anyone I've ever seen love their ideas. And he would sell more ideas just because of that. And I would look mm-hmm. at his ideas and I'm like, they weren't necessarily better. Like they, they were fine. But um, that level of believing in your ideas and your passion helps you get heard, helps your ideas get sold. And it's, you know, it's the old adage of believe in yourself, but, but believe in yourself in a way that your passion is contagious. And like Kristen, the story you told, like you didn't get fired because you were so passionate about the idea. I mean, there could have been other reasons, but it really goes a long way. Um, and then also learn learn how to work with who needs to hear you. Like I I used to have a boss that I knew, like don't present to him if he's hungry. Mm. And bring him a snack. I had another boss that was so scattered that I had to bring things in bolded and highlighted and my partner actually suggested it and I was a little bit like really like we're presenting it was like you know no so like things like that like learn how to work with who you're working with um and then I agree like raise your hand for for other things I um I years ago there was a brief going around I really wanted to get on and my boss was like no it's for this team because they've been working on the crap clients and if they want you to work on it you can but I can't just give it to you and I was like all right so I went into their office back when we had offices, two guys, and they were just sitting there hanging out playing poker. And they were like, do you want to play poker with us? And I was like, okay, I don't know how to play poker. But all I have to say, so I sat down with them and they're like, hey, do you want to work on this brief with us? I'm like, sure. And I wasn't in there um, trying to get on the brief, but, but my point is there's a lot of ways to be heard, so to speak, or to connect or to get involved. But I think being the most passionate about your ideas and also speaking up in meetings, if you're if you're not, or if people are speaking over you, um, you know, be sure to politely say, you know, well, can I finish? As we've seen in politics lately, but um, yeah, don't don't be the quiet one in the room. And unfortunately, yes, sometimes you do have to be the one that works harder. But I do find that that benefits you in the end, anyway. Do you feel that women? for speaking up or maybe even people of color, women of color, if you've noticed, like I sometimes notice that they were punished more for speaking up or seen as more aggressive. Do you ever feel that that happened to you for speaking up more? You know, I, a specific, t- yes. I once had a boss that was like, I know you think I'm a hack because I was speaking up a lot to him about stuff. And I think he didn't like that he couldn't sort of, you know. Control you. Control me. I remember another time presenting ideas for, um, we were pitching Howard Stern, um, his radio show, but it was a pitch. So it was a room of all guys and me with ideas around Howard Stern. And so of course the, the concepts and the writing were really cheeky. And I, and I remember, uh, the guy running the meeting and when it got to me and all the guys had presented their work and he goes, Danielle, I'm shocked to kind of like, yeah. And I just, I didn't even think about it. I said, well, if it makes you uncomfortable, you can leave. And then after I said, I'm like, oh my God. Yeah. But things like that. And I'm like, he, he wouldn't have said that to a guy. I think there's less of that today though. I really do. And I think it's getting better. Um, but sometimes I think a good thing to say too, is like, how, like how would a, a guy at this agency handle this? If you think you're being treated differently because you're a woman or would, it, would, it, would they say this, you know, to a guy or would a guy stand up more for his idea or am I just thinking I'm not being hurt? You know, that's kind of a good comparison. Um, And then also I would say too, like, don't try to be a guy though, which I, when I first started this business, I was like, I want my portfolio. People can't tell if a man or a woman wrote it. And because all the best work that was winning awards were very like male focused categories. Mm -hmm. Um, But what we bring to the process is a whole other topic, but it's, it's invaluable and it creates a balance and we have insights that, you know, a man never will have just as we won't have a male insight, just being, I mean, you can try, but being in that body is just a different experience. So, um, you know, I would say be who totally own who you are too. And the more you own who you are, the more you'll be heard. Kirsten or Liz. 
that's a per- pretty perfect answer. <laughs> you know, it's gonna be hard to add to that. I, I think, uh, I think there's Danielle's answer is perfect verbatim. Uh, plus one, all of it. I would add that the role of side projects actually are really helpful for female creatives, women creatives. I don't like the term female. I don't know why. Um, Because you, I think every creative male and female experience being typecast, but women especially, and we tend to get only put on the femme empowerment stuff a lot. And then because you're good at that, you just continue to be put on that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And side projects have a wonderful natural way of helping you break out of typecasting. I tend to, I, a lot of people, I would tend to get the briefs that are very emotive, um, but I, I'd like to think I'm funny. So that's where some of my side projects come in. Um, and I'm a bit subversive. So this side, one side project I was working on, it was called High Art. And we got some comedians high to look at art and get their high thoughts about it. And that's like something that I, people weren't expecting from me. And from there, I got other kinds of subversive briefs and helped me kind of expand what my portfolio was. So definitely big advocate of side projects and how they help women. Yeah, it's uh, one of the reasons, again, for us to promote side projects is because it allows people of all backgrounds to stand out. And we've had so many, we've had 538 entries and just such amazing work coming through um, the sideshow and have amazing people's eyes on top of those side projects. Um, And it's almost like, I don't know, we have the saying of to come out in front, you have to get through this side uh, here at the sideshow. So it's really cool to hear people's um, opinion about side projects. How about yourself, Kirsten? Well, I love what Liz and Danielle have, have had to say, and I'd love to plus one on both of what they're saying. Um, with regards to side projects, if, if you are in a place where uh, you don't feel you're valued, where you try, 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 and you're not going to get your voice out there, go somewhere that who deserves you. Find, some, find another place that wants you and absolutely deserves you. Um, side projects help you do that. Uh, not saying the agency I was at before, uh, Widens was, it was amazing in its own way, but our goal, my creative partner and I at the time, I was, I was paired with the most incredible woman called Lisa Jella for 11 years. And again, as a double female team, a lot of, uh, preconceived ideas about what you should be working on. Yeah. So she and I started working on our side projects. Um, one year we had gone to talk to Wyden and they said to us, your work's too traditional. In fact, the person who'd gone into interview before us had created World Peace Day and got Afghan warlords to put down their guns. So um, we basically said to Tony Davidson, who was the CCO there, so we need to create World Peace to get a job at Widens. He said, yeah, that's pretty much it. Hugh, a few years later on, where side projects were one of the main reasons why they came to us and offered us a job. So know that, A, the people that are right for you, your magic match is out there if you're at a point of no return where you just feel you can't be heard. Use your side projects to get you there and to get you noticed. And Danielle, you were talking about uh, being able to self-promote and having the confidence that we sometimes see these gents have out there. If you get to the point where you've done everything you think you possibly can to self-promote, find your ally in the agency who's going to promote for you. My my favorite allies in life, I wish I had more women to be allies from Mm -hmm. Ohio, but I've had two most spectacular mentors who've always been allies and have promoted for me. So if my voice wasn't heard, then somebody else in a higher higher position, their voice is more likely to be heard. So plus one to what both of those ladies are saying. Yeah, yeah, no, it's really, it's helpful to hear this because there were times, many times that I spoke up for myself and I, there was just silence or disdain or even there were times I was told, fuck you, fuck you, shut the fuck up. Um, These are kind of things that definitely happen, especially when you're the only person of color, woman of color, woman in the the room and they, uh, a lot of people won't speak up for you after um, such things happen because they want to keep their jobs. Um, So I have a quick question from an anonymous attendee. You guys kind of answered it. Uh, Do 
I have to become one of the bros to be successful? I have to say the poker story was pretty interesting to me because that was a way of like, again, it's not about the why. And we talked about this with Jeff Greenspan. It's also the how, how are you approaching your audience? Um, that's all of what communications is, is how are you going to approach your audience? If your boss has a really great um, project that comes up and you want to be on it, even though you're not considered someone who might be a beer girl working on beer, um, how do you talk to them if they're in the middle of a poker game and you talk to them or you feed them because they're hungry? Um, that's another way of going at it. So I guess I'll, I'll open that question up to everyone. Do you have to become one of the bros to become successful? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. And I, I echo what Danielle is saying is that you as a woman have value and what you bring to the table. So lean into that. And the more you lean into it, the more people actually respond. Um, I think I try not to look at it as like, how can I be a bro when I'm talking to bros? I, I look at it, I'm in a, from a military family, so forgive the mm. military analogy, but like, I like to look at it as being a person that someone would want to be in the trenches with. We, we are often in stressful, we spend a lot of time with each other in stressful environments. And how can you be the person that they would want someone, your leader or your coworker would want to be in the trench with? How can you be someone that's helpful, that keeps the mood light, that solves problems um, and just kind of don't mind a lot of close quarter tight spaces, being in tight spaces with. So like, just how can you be a good, a good person in the trenches with, and you can be exactly who you are and be that person. Okay. There's nothing else to add. I will keep on going. Um, so we've already spoken to why we love side projects. Liz has, um, do you either uh, one of you, uh, Danielle or Kirsten, want to speak to what what motivates you for side projects? Jeff and I we were talking earlier about how his motivation is often anger for side projects. Uh, for instance, his hip, hipster traps um, and tourist lanes in New York, and I, that really resonated with me because some of my favorite stand up comedians are um, you know Bill Burr, Sebastian Maniscalco. A lot of that stuff comes from anger. One of my favorite Sebastian Maniscalco bits is doesn't anyone get embarrassed anymore um so what about you what motivates your side projects is it emotion is it seeing something and just uh feeling that you need to be the change at that moment in the world what is it that motivates you to uh create your side projects i mean i think and back to jeff like i said i do know jeff and i know he's very motivated by anger <laughs> but he channels it well um, but I will talk, first I'll talk what I love about side projects and his tourist lane uh, project is, is one of my favorites and it's, and for people who don't know, and, and as a New Yorker, oh my God, you're on the sidewalk and you can tell who are tourists and they're walking slow. Yeah. Our freeway is the sidewalks and you have yeah. somewhere. So he, <laughs> he created this, um, he literally painted a um, lane and, you know, split the mm -hmm. side first New Yorkers and he had people standing there, you know, calling people out if they were walking too slow or too fast. And the cool thing about side projects, like to me, that's an example of, you could easily be like, wouldn't that be cool if we could just have that, you know, have, tourists should be in their own lane. Someone maybe would say that, but a side project, you, you hear that and you're like, well, okay, I'm gonna go do that. You know, versus just like, it's an idea that's out there. And I think what's powerful about side projects is you don't have to hope you sell it to a client. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You don't have to wait to, I mean, you have to figure out how to get it produced, but, but you don't have to, you know, there's so many factors getting something made for an official brief for an official client and for a side project. Um, you just, you don't have to do that. Um, my, and, and something I did that was like the most fulfilling personally, and it's not even, I didn't do it trying to like leverage something, but I worked, I did a whole um, TEDx event and I was in Maui for an extended time. And so we put on an event there. It was a 1500 person event. It was four of us, a team of four of us doing it. Luckily, someone had a major production background, but wow. I worked with the presenters on their ideas worth spreading and help them craft their talks and title their talks. And I've always been a fan of TED. I'm obviously a fan of ideas if I'm in this business. And the things you learn doing these side projects are great. Cause I was like, oh, yeah. I have transferable skills. I thought I could only make ads. 
but I can make talks and, and do, you know, and, and talk yeah. to those who came from, you know, science and all these very disparate worlds. They were, it was a, like reflection back to me that there was value there um, as well. And then I just felt like it was a contribution to this small island that I'd been spending time on to bring an intellectual event there because Hawaii doesn't have a lot of that. Um, yeah, so that was my favorite. One of my favorite pieces of 360 that we never got to do, but I was like dying for it was um, when I was working in pharmaceutical and it was actually creating a play like with really good actors and like it was about cancer. I, I was just like, that was my like dream side project to possibly do like really get really good like Michael Shannon and like just top actors in a play um that it was just something I was like I've never seen that before associated with advertising um but yeah it is it's amazing what can stimulate us um usually again like Jeff was saying with anger with the hipster traps the tourist lanes and then of course with the inside the actors studio which he did inside the actors crisis crisis actors studio um, but it is funny what the impetus can often be um, it's usually from a very powerful emotion like we were talking about earlier Kristen uh, how about yourself so uh, I have a friend called David Goodfellow who runs an organization in the UK called the kindness offensive and his side project has led him to become the world record holder for random acts of kindness and he says that kindness is one of the most selfish things you can do. So if that's the case, I really think there's a lovely selfishness to side projects. One of my favorite side projects involved my partner Lisa and I finding the most spectacular work from an anonymous German street art collective called Mental Gussy. They created lenticular fences where they would paste um, uh, wheat paste posters on one edge of a fence. So when you look at the fence, uh, from a side, you would see a picture. When you look straight on, it's invisible. Mm. So that's really, really cool. We know the guys at Amnesty, and we would love to make the invisible visible when it comes to people who are unfairly incarcerated. So what do you do with that? Well, we reached out to Mental Garci on a whim and said, could you help us? They said, yes, absolutely, we will. There was a problem. They were in Germany, and we were in London, and we had no money. Could you fly yourself out at your own expense to come help us do it? Yes, we will. And we got to work with these incredible artists. We got to make work that made us feel good because it was yeah. making a difference in the world. So selfishly, I get to meet really cool people. <laughs> I get to have the chutzpah to reach out and just see if somebody would be up for a collaboration and make a little bit of a difference. Selfishness, that's, that's, that's the reason. <laughs> I like that. So that moves us on to our next question. Um, these were posed by Danielle, which I thought were great. Um, is it a disadvantage to be a female creative in advertising? So I'll let, and again, this is an open conversation. Whoever wants to talk, go ahead. I'm not trying to control anything. Well, I'll address it since I, I suggested it. And, and it's interesting because I, you know, when I saw the, the title of the podcast and, and kind of your little snippet about it, and I thought, yeah, it's interesting being a woman in advertising. It's different being a man in advertising, but I do think it's different now than when I first started. Mm -hmm. um, and I do remember when I was in ad school and speakers would come and they'd say, you know, as a woman, you're going to have to work twice as hard in the business. Mm -hmm. so before I even got in the business, I was hearing those things. Or mm -hmm. I had a teacher who said women aren't funny. To your point, Liz, that's a person. Oh boy, that's a whole other, yeah. Yeah, and then the president of the ad school, when I was about to graduate, said, call this creative director that I wanted to work for and, and tell him you have great legs and you can type. And I was like cool what you know right. uh, that, that was that was like mad men still alive and he and i thought what business do you have having a school as women students if that's your, anyway whole other topic so i so it was a little it was a little different and there were definitely i think when you're a young woman it, it can be harder as well but i will say i think it's i think it's really an asset and i think more and more I don't know it's because I'm older and more experienced now, but I'm not seeing any of that as much anymore. Not as much nearly as like, I mean, I got started like a while ago and I, not as much nearly from me. And that's why when you, you guys are talking, I'm kind of like, did I experience, again, again, I was at different agencies, right? But I was like, did I experience a completely different world here? Because I was overhearing conversations of guys being like, yeah, she's not a size six or lower. I won't date her. I won't fuck her. You know, like after 35, women should shoot themselves in New York. <laughs> like, just like all sorts of things. And I, I would be like, wait, this is, 
and it, behind, you know, if you, anyone studied improv or comedy, it's like behind every joke is there some form of truth. So there was always like this, and especially if you're the only woman, you're kind of like, oh my God, it's on a primitive level. You're like, how am I going to survive this? Um, and as a person of color. So when you say that you had to hear it in ad school, I never heard it in ad school. They never said that you have to work twice as hard thing. Um, I only started to really notice. I mean, I'd noticed it all through life, but like once I got to the agencies, that's when I really got to notice. And I got to notice too, that if you complained about it or brought it up, like, hey, this isn't funny or this is weird or this is a bad joke or you know what I mean? It, you were just seen as the problem maker, the, the troublemaker. And you were seen as someone who wasn't cool, who wouldn't go with the flow, you know? And I do, I mean, look, there's so many fem phenomenal female, Dorothy Parker, Tina Fey. I mean, we've got some funny, funny comedians throughout history who are women. So that to me is like, I'm like, where did y'all go to, like, where did y'all come up through? Because what I heard and what I had to deal with, it's like, it seems like a completely different story. I mean, I, you know, I won't say that I didn't hear some of those things or that I didn't walk into a room of all guys and they were telling a joke and then would quickly stop because it was offensive right. or I wasn't out with clients and then we all ended up at a strip club and I was the only woman right. with like, yeah, all that happened. Um, I have my Me Too stories as well, which I'm not going to go into. And here. advertising Me Too, I feel, takes it to a whole new level. Do you ever feel like people don't believe your stories unless they worked in advertising also? I don't know. I think, you know, when the Me Too thing kind of came to the surface, I just remember a lot of guys I worked with were, were very surprised by some of the stories and I don't know any women who were. Um, so I think there are a lot of good guys in our business too, who kind of were immune to that or, or not unaware because they're just like doing their thing. Um, so yeah, it's, you know, there are definitely times that, that it wasn't easy. And I, so I, when I first got in, out of school too, and probably for years after, didn't want a female partner because I didn't want to be labeled as the chick team. Um, and I had a job that I took as, as without a partner and I was working on Miller Lite, so beer, Mets, sports, American Express, Delta Airlines, things that weren't girly. And they ended up hiring a, a woman that I wasn't crazy about just because we'd met and I could tell the chemistry, you know, wasn't great. Mm. But they, they promised me that we weren't going to be the chick team. And mm. I think she'd been there a day and I got a call from an account person I'd never met. She said, I'm so excited. We're going to be working on Avon together. And I was like, what I, was, bro team. <laughs> well, I was curious because it was a broken promise from my, right. body, you know, but, but what I will say is I've also like, I've had a lot of male partners that say they prefer working with me to men. Not that, not because of, of gender as much. I think because we bring, there's a, there's a nice balance there. Mm -hmm. And Women, speaking of, of empathy too, I mean, that's what we bring. And if you have a lot of empathy, you're, you're more tapped into the universal truths that we're always looking for, right? Something that resonates. And empathy is like, you know, guys talk about trusting your gut, but like women's intuition is like trusting your gut on steroids. It's like the best. So I, I don't know. I just, I feel like more and more people are valuing that. People are realizing that diversity is a smart business move too because you get more interesting ideas mm -hmm. women are used to not being the status quo so we can come at it a different perspective and i've had god i had this one so many stories about this now that i think about it but i had i was working at a place that they had a like a motor oil account and the cco didn't initially want me on it because i was a woman but then everyone else was busy and like my ideas went forward because i looked at like a different perspective I didn't know I didn't know about engines and that's why like I beat out the other team because these guys were like super into all the details of it and I'm like people don't care about that they want their farm equipment to run longer you know um so I think sometimes it is an advantage and yeah as far as when you speak up and people are pissed about that that's of course more about them and it doesn't make it oh yeah I mean but, that, yeah the women yeah. aren't funny thing is always kind of like, or like what's funny is it as a woman, if you're remotely uh, amusing and you say something funny, there's that, ha ha ha, that laugh. And then that pullback of like, oh my gosh, I just laughed at her joke. I shouldn't be laughing at her joke. Why am I laughing at her joke? Why is it weird that she's funny? Um, yeah. Anything else we want to add in Kirsten or Liz? Before I get to our another questions that we keep coming, we have questions coming, which is great. Okay. I should answer all the questions because she's very good at it. <laughs> um, so we have a question from Taisha Deke. 
Um, what if I have to keep fighting to promote myself and my potential, even though I'm in the trenches constantly? I would say from start promoting yourself to other agencies. <laughs> um, this we've kind of already touched on it, but this business requires you, you need advocates. And if you are at a place where you do not have an advocate, then go to a place where someone will be your advocate and ally for your ideas and for your, what you bring to the table. Um, and I think it's, it's, you can't, you can't make people see if they are blind. So if you can just promote yourself to somewhere else, that is probably the best tactic to do. And I, I'm not a fan of staying at places where you don't have anything to learn anymore from the people that are, are leading you. So if you're not finding that, then that should be a good North star. Is there um, like a, since, since this is such a difficult subject, um, especially for those that are new to the industry, uh, cause a lot of times it's, is it, you, there's this question of like, is it me? Is it my fault? Which I've noticed that a lot of women do not all. Um, is there a time limit? Would you say like a year or two years? What would you say that that time limit is? I think, well, it's different for each person. And I don't, I would look at it as who do you have creative like-mindedness? And sometimes people just don't click. Yeah. And there's not much that you can do to change that. Either you you have a, a natural familiarity with with somebody and it just kind of naturally flows or it's work. Um, and the best environments are places you just naturally click with people. Yeah. Um, have a creative, the same creative sensibilities and th things that excite you or that's kind of in the same places. And that's really the healthiest environment to be in. I don't know if that answers. What was the question? Where did you start? No, the, it answers the question so well because I feel like so many times it comes back to like, again, like a dating analogy or, or boyfriend, girlfriend, or girlfriend, girlfriend, whatever analogy, which is in a relationship. Uh, so many times, if you don't have the six similar senses of humor or something to connect with, it's just not, it's going to be a difficult relationship. Um, and if it feels like work, there might be a place that might be better for you. And uh, again, like what I was asking before is a lot of times coming into the business, um, there were a lot of times I wondered, was it, is it my fault? Am I doing something wrong? Is it, am I taking things too personally? Um, and I think my question really is about like for um, looking for new positions, for instance, let's say someone's been somewhere for six months, is it better to power through it for a full year? Um, because when you go to another agency, they might ask you, why were you only there for a short amount of time? So that's why I was asking what, what you would say the time limit is, you know? I don't know if there is a time limit. I know for myself, it takes, I am a slow burn kind of person and it takes me a while to kind of understand people and for people to understand me. So I, I try to give things two years, but I think if you know, you know, <laughs> too. Yeah. You can get out, but I think easier said than done, you know, like it's, we're, we're in a very difficult uh, job climate. So yeah. it might not be that, that an easy option just to go and get another job. So if you are in a place where you're not being heard, I think one thing that has helped me in the past is looking at each person that I'm having tension with or conflict with as a flesh brief, as a, uh, Kristen knows what I'm talking about, but each person in themselves, look at them as a brief of like, how can I understand this person better? Yeah. Best way to speak with them, which is something Danielle also touched on. What do I need to do to alter my behavior to better connect with this person that I'm having a, a bit of obstacles with? Um, so that's something within your control. I'm not saying change who you are, but you can change how you approach cert certain cert situations. Yeah, the, the approach thing is a big deal. No, please go ahead. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah, and especially in um, this time period, um, because I've been, I was reviewing so many questions on Fishbowl um, in the Women in Advertising Board, and that was such, that was a question that had kept coming up. People were just feeling overworked, underpaid, overlooked, um, so much anxiety uh, going on right now. And I can't quit my job because I need to still pay the bills and I'm so lucky to have a job still. Um, so particularly in these times um, of the pandemic for what people should do, because sometimes, you know, you do, some people 
they did just quit because they couldn't take it anymore and they had to protect their mental health. I think you raise a really good point there when you ask about time limits. If that job is destroying you, if your health is going to suffer, and look, I we work in advertising. I can tell you I got three hours sleep last night. It is what it is because that's the project I'm in at the moment. But mm -hmm. if that's constant and you're not finding purpose in your work, whatever mm -hmm. that might be, there is no point sticking around. Your health is not worth it. Um, I like what you said, Liz, though, and I'm going to paraphrase it, the idea of um, if you can't change, if you really can't change what's going on, you can't leave, then what can you do to change the way you approach that situation or to change your view of that situation? You talked about that, that flesh brief as well. For me, it's can I find purpose in what I'm doing? Um, I, at one stage, with my amazing female partner, got pigeonholed in beauty brands. Beauty brands are not for me. Head and shoulders, it's great. It solves dander up. It, it just wasn't for me. And at that time, we found purpose in the side projects that we were doing whilst we were in that job as well. So we couldn't leave. I was uh, on a, 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 the UK version of a green card at the time. Mm, so mm -hmm. you can't leave a job for a mm -hmm. certain amount of time. So what can you do? if possible, to compartmentalize, give your absolute best to your job, mm -hmm. but find something that fill, fulfills you in other ways, if it's creatively or if it's to do with making the world a better place, find what that purpose is and see if you can do anything within the 24 hours in your day to give you that fulfillment that you need. Yeah, that's very helpful advice because it's, you know, again, like we're saying empathy, emotion being, you know, connected more with that in general as a woman, um, it's very hard not to, like you were saying before, take things personally and to be able to just draw that wall um, because of business and commerce and to be able to still move forward. Um, I think that's, a, that's again, one comes right back to the sideshow and the side projects, why we love them because it is like, there's not always a brief, you're just having fun, you're just letting go and you're able to connect to it in a way that doesn't uh, create a stress. It's a, it's a release um, and a let go. Um, and so now we have another great question. Any tips? Oh, I love this one. Um, we've talked about men. Uh, any tips on dealing with other female coworkers who are especially harsh? Um, as I've interviewed, and uh, I have a podcast, like again, like I've said, I've developed um, that I've worked on audio. A lot of times what comes out is a lot of, a lot of the issues is um, again, women with versus women. So um, yeah, if anybody has any insights on that, I would love to hear it. Um, I, hearing that question too, I hate that that's even a question. It's like, it's so disappointing, but it's, it's so real. And I once took a departure from advertising and, and worked at a company that was all women thinking that it would be a different sort of opportunity, different environment. And it was so much harder than working with all men. Um, so, so, and I don't know like the situation this per this person's asking about specifically, but I mean, there, there's a couple things. There's, I mean, there's the old kill them with kindness. Like, can you dismantle it by passing a compliment or helping them with, with some work or something like that, or also address it. I find a lot of times women can do the passive aggressive thing. Mm -hmm. If they're not being nice, they're also not being direct, whereas men are better at being direct. So you don't have to, you know, be confrontational, but you could, you know, hey, what did you mean when you said said that? <laughs> said that? No, really, that would say. No, I know. I'm laughing because I've always my boyfriend has to hear about this all the time. But it's it is the 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 conversation I have with him where I'm like, I just prefer someone to be like, don't do this next time, you know, just right. be direct with me. Yeah. Yeah. Or you could grab him and pull him aside and say. Can we talk for a second and be like, look, we're working together. I feel like there's just a weird vibe. Is it just me? Like just straight up ask, um, I would say. And if it's someone you're working with, like as your partner, switch partners, get out of that, that situation because that's not okay. And that's not gonna lead you to good work or happiness or health. Yeah, yeah I mean, just, just, it's hard enough to crack a brief and to have to spend time deciphering code between what they're saying and what they're meaning. It's, it's mind boggling. Um, and that's why earlier when we were speaking about this, I've noticed too, my favorite partners have tended to be men and I've gotten along the best with them because there is this like interesting, like yin, yang, Shiva, Shakti combination where it's like, there's just balance of the universe and everything just works out the way it should. Um, that's, that's just how I feel. But that's, that's why I was laughing about the comment about the past passive aggressiveness, because I, my bullshit meter, sometimes it just gets to the point where I'm like, I just don't have time for this. Yeah, you just call it out. 
Yeah. You just call it. And I love that. That's so f- refreshing, actually. It's just like, yeah, is there some tension here? Have I done something? I, I would love to correct it if I have, but then it's just calling it out and it just makes everything clear and you can focus on the work. Yeah, I I agree with that. I don't, sometimes I, I would even wager to believe that maybe the woman isn't even aware mm-hmm. of the way she's being harsh, you know, um, and just if you can approach it in a non-confrontational way and just ask like, if this, you know, can I do something better? I would appreciate it if maybe you handled it this way instead. And I mean, as some, I've been on the receiving end of, of a woman saying that she didn't appreciate the way I spoke to her. And I wasn't even aware that I was mm-hmm. being that way. I thought I was just being direct and different people respond to different things. And after she, re- she told me about it, I felt horrified and I learned to work with her better and we're still friends to this day, but had she allowed me to continue to be in my hole and, and, and behave the way that I thought was fine, then we would have had continued tension and we wouldn't have had a good working relationship. So I, I do agree that just making them aware can do wonders. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes somebody just, again, it's like, it's just, it gets, you, you don't have to do it in a, a fighting context. Mm-hmm. It's more just like a, yeah. And just, uh, Hey, did I do this? But I gotta say, like, and again, this has happened to me where I'm like, have I done something wrong or have I said something wrong? And then I get the, I don't know. Do you think you've said something wrong? And I'm like, Oh my gosh, this is not going to go. Kirsten's laughing. Um, this is not going to go well. So again, you, I like the way you just candidly just say, Hey, is there something I've done wrong? But I think when you are met with, I don't know, do you think you can do something? I'm like, Oh my gosh, I just, I don't know. I, maybe it's just because I, I don't know. I just a personality type. Yeah, people get defensive. For it. Yeah, like just some people that get defensive, and kind of, <laughs> that's definitely their problem. But I think any any we all have a responsibility in this business to kind of hear people and under process what they're saying, and that is their truth, and you don't need to be defensive about it. Right, and again, these are qualities that amazing women in advertising who have come to your level and above. It's it's something that you have had to learn along the way, but I have seen so many men who do not have these qualities who have gone to even higher roles. Um, which brings us to the next question, which is in your opinion, why um, is advertising mostly dominated by men? Um, and uh, it, why, is the, why is the environment that way compared to uh, other businesses? And I wanna say, I wanna say I'm saying this name right, Consiglia. Thank you for that question. So in your opinion, why is advertising mostly dominated by men? Why is the environment is, why is it the way it is compared to other businesses? I think uh, it's, it's funny you say that because when I first started, yes, it was dominated by men. When I look at agencies now, when I, talk, when I have amazing young women reach out to me who are getting into the industry, I get really excited. I don't think it's, I don't think at those lower levels, it is dominated by men from a creative perspective. I'm seeing really uh, equally split creative departments. I, I absolutely love that. The thing that interests me is what happens to the amazing ladies along the way and what can we do to support these amazing ladies along the way? Mm-hmm. Um, as a midweight, it seemed to be that my creative, my female creative partner and I could earn three times the amount of awards that guys did and they would get promoted quicker than we would. So what can we do to help those amazing ladies who are juniors? We've got to support them to get yeah. all their skills. That comes from mentorship, from men and women. Midweight, what can we do to give them an amazing path for growth, to understand what we can do to raise them up as leaders, to support them as they become ACDs and CDs? Because it's tough, but it's really difficult to just be thrown into yeah. that role. There is a training that comes with that. Yes. Giving these amazing midweight creatives the opportunity to see growth for themselves in the agency means you don't lose that amazing talent. And then when you get to the even higher levels, let's be honest, okay, you've got a thick skin, you've survived the late nights, how do you balance? And I have such so much respect for Liz and all the amazing mums out there. I don't know how mums do it. Information here. I chose not to have kids because I didn't think I could do it and, and have an advertising career as well. I see amazing women who can do it. It's supporting those women realizing that, you know, we, we work incredibly hard and that may mean we get to go tell bedtime stories to our kids, tuck them in 
and then go back to work. There are different ways of working. I'm inspired by the fact that COVID, for all its terribleness, has shown that you can work in different ways. You can work from home. I don't know, again, how these amazing women do it with kids, but yeah. of course they do it. They're super women. We are yeah. super women. We work in advertising. These women have kids. So support them at junior levels, give them path for growth at midweight, and allow people to be their true, honest, authentic leaders when they're senior and do it in whatever way they want as mums, as women, as family members, as wives. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny because I've never met any of you before. And it's so interesting to see like the energies and talk to the different energies. And I've got to say like, Liz, there's this like, you you have it together, but there's like this like thing that happens with moms that they're just like, they're chill. It's like, they've got this. And I'm like, oh man, like I'm like watching you. And it's just so cool to see like that energy forged because- by fire. <laughs> I've been forged by fire. <laughs> Yeah. I just think it's, I just think, I mean, it's just so cool for me to see that because I'm just like, oh, again, no matter what lifestyle you choose, um, have kids, not have kids, uh, for other females who are coming up the ranks and see people of all different backgrounds coming up through the ranks and becoming CDs and GCDs um, and higher, it is just, it, you're giving them hope, you know? So definitely from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for that because just your existence makes people go, oh, well, I could possibly do that too if I, you know, do what they did and get their advice. Um, before we go, I have a couple of um, last, last, uh, I guess, cleanup questions. Um, if you have any advice for people who are watching right now, let's say someone's a frustrated junior and all they're getting right now to work on is point of sale or banners. Um, besides side projects, um, what would you say is like just a really good, maybe one line phrase to approach someone higher up at their company um, to get on a project that's really needy? Um, because a lot of times people don't know how to phrase it. So if you have any advice on how to phrase it for these juniors uh, coming up the ranks, or maybe an even intern, um, would love to hear that. Uh I'll go. Um, I think it's inviting yourself to the brief as much as you can and to say, hey, I heard there's um, there's a Super Bowl brief go going on. Would you mind if I threw in some ideas? And I promise you, zero CDs will say no. Every creative director will be like, heck yes, please. Um, also, <laughs> it's funny, I'm an introvert and I um, I never did this. And, the, and then when I became a creative director, I saw extroverts do this. And I was like, oh, this is how you guys were doing it. Yeah. But just asking to go to lunch with a creative director every yeah. now and then, and then to say, you know, explain what you're looking to do and what you want to achieve. And it, and it works. But imagine that. To send that email, though, I remember as like a junior or even mid-level, <laughs> like working on a banner, your you're like self-esteem is only at a certain place when you're working on banners, right? Um, and you keep getting working on banners. But to send that email to have, it's almost like you have to just like suck it up, bite the bullet, and then just hit send. So for the juniors who are in that position right now, just bite the bullet and hit send is, is my advice because it is the scariest thing, especially if you're introverted or uh, you're just not used to doing that, used to asking for what you really want. Um, just just look, look, what are they gonna do? They can't come to your house, especially now. So bite, bite the bullet and hit that send. Um, thank I, you, that was an amazing answer. I would say bring your best to your banners because even the small things can sometimes yeah. cause a big impression on other people. And surprise and delight, you got into this advertising industry and it's so hard to even get in the ad game that once you're in, you've got, you know, you had confidence to get here in the first place, surprise and delight, steal the brief off somebody's desk, do the ideas and then surprise and delight your creative director with it. Don't ask permission. I love that. Thank you. Danielle? Well, on that point, women ask permission far too much. I think yes. we're for permission far too much. And again, I, you know, ask yourself, like, would a, would a guy be thinking this? Would a guy do this? Or what would a guy do if you're feeling like it's a, it's a woman thing or whatever, but generally they're not asking for permission. So I love that. Um, yeah. And again, no one's going to turn down a good idea ever, ever, especially if there's a big brief Just everyone wants as many ideas coming in as possible from, from wherever. And hopefully you work at a place 
that is of the philosophy a good idea can come from anywhere. If not, that's a bigger problem. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I love that. Don't ask for permission, just go after it. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I know Pixar, don't they say even the janitors can come in and pitch? Um, everybody can get three minutes to pitch the, the idea of a, for a future Pixar film. At least that's what I remember hearing in one of their um, sessions. Now, on the opposite end, right before we end, uh, what about because ageism is such a, and it, it's, it's only being touched, touched on now more recently um, as we are sp speaking about racism, homophobia in the industry. Um, what would you say to somebody who is opposite of a junior and has feels like they're not really going anywhere. They could have been further by now. Um, besides side projects to stand out, um, what would you suggest for them to do at this point? I, I mean, I, you know, I would say, first of all, ask yourself, is it true? Or, you know, are you feeling that way or is it really true? I find and luckily, knock wood, but the older I get in this business, the more I'm asked to, to run things or to help with things. And, you know, often when we bring in people to help us crack a brief, if everyone's too busy or whatever, it's we're calling in more senior talent because they have the experience and we need ideas quickly. And that's the, the value that you bring when you're, when you're older. I mean, the more you do something, the better you get at it. So I would, first of all, like look at the value you bring after doing this for this many years. Um, and just really be like, you know, own that, I, you know, and I don't think, I don't know, the ageism thing too, I think is getting less and less in this business as well. I mean, yeah, there's not a lot of people in their seventies working in the business, but probably cause they're just like, I'm tired. I'm out <laughs> by the time they're done. I wonder if the, uh, if, you're, if you've been in an agency for a very long time, perhaps you've been pigeonholed as well. Mm -hmm. is, it the, is it the time to look for new opportunities? Because there'll be a lot of people out there, a lot of agencies out there who would love experience. So maybe that's a chance to actually prove something to yourself and see what opportunities are out there, whether that's advertising or whether that's things using your creative skills in a wider realm. So, you know, um, if you're not getting what you want and you've been there a while, start exploring elsewhere. Have you by any chance hired anyone off of a side project that you've seen? This is for everyone. I forgot to ask this. And it's, of course, the whole thing is about side projects. So you don't have to answer it right away. It's just something that just popped into my head before we end. Um, I have plans to hire someone. Because oh, I love that. <laughs> Are you a Scorpio? That was so mysterious. <laughs> like, I have plans. So side projects I can't tell you. <laughs> and that that's what's on top of my mind for when I think of who I want to employ. It's that's, those that come to my mind first. That's incredible. That's so cool to hear. Dan Danielle, how about yourself? Have you ever hired anyone off a side project? Not specifically off a side project, but I have seen someone hired based on a side project and it wasn't the right choice because that was kind of the rest of the book wasn't really solid. And so I would say like side projects are great and they're part of the, of the package. Um, so you, you really need both, but I mean, they show such, they show, you know, ambition and passion and different thinking. And, and so I think they're great. Just make sure the rest of it is there too, which generally it is. I mean, this was a very specific case. Yeah. But I'm not, I wouldn't, I'm not saying that's a reason not to. But yeah, I mean, I was going to say some people only have the opportunity to work on certain banners, again, in point of sales at their agency. And if all they have to get stand out is side projects, just a great way to get seen. And Liz, about the ageism question, and then also have you hired someone um, off a side project? Um, yeah, I don't know if I have anything additional to add than what Danielle and Kirsten said. I think I think all the things that were true for younger creative are pr true regardless of your age and where you are in your career. Like even, e like even now, I could do more to like promote myself and invite myself to brief. So I don't think that ever stops, regardless of what level you're at, um, and it only serves to benefit you. And I haven't hired someone just because of a side project, but. Uh, side projects have helped 
color my idea of or my understanding of a candidate in ways that I think helped them ultimately being hired um, in addition to all their other their other work. But I think there's something about the side projects that show personality that mm -hmm. your average your work in advertising just doesn't. And um, I think I, I love I love seeing people's personalities at play, which is what side projects do. It's the people you're going to be spending all that time with at the mm -hmm. office and close quarters. All right. Well, ladies, thank you so very much. Um, again, uh, this has been the first episode of the Mad Women podcast on Zoom. So I very much appreciate all of you taking the time out of your very busy schedules to join us. And um, if there's any other last phrases you want to say, um, that's great. And if not, we could just end it and say goodbye. So Thank you for having me and thank you lovely ladies for hanging out. How nice it is to chat with other ladies. So I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. This is so much fun. Um, and I know a lot of people got a lot out of it. So thank you so much. Have a good night, everyone. Thank Bye. you.